I'm Mike Stovall. I'm the uh, chair of the social sciences department here at the college. I teach sociology, and I'm serving as the moderator for the panel today. I'm just curious, how many of you, unless you were uh, told by a faculty member, knew that today was Constitution Day, you know, September 17th? I just expect all the hands to fly up immediately. No, okay, I'm not really sure. There's probably a few of you that did. But uh, the Maryland legislature, sure, has actually suggested that um, colleges and institutions of higher learning and even uh, public high schools, for instance, should do something to recognize uh, Constitution Day. And uh, that's, that's one of the reasons we decided to have this little panel discussion today, was give you guys a chance to think a little bit, reflect on what it means to live in a country that has a constitution and how it's impacted your lives. What I'm going to do is introduce our panel members here. And what my pl plan is, is to throw out some questions of them, have them answer them, uh, see what, how, how it makes you feel or uh, whether you have some ideas from that. And we have some time at the end. You guys might have some uh, questions for the group or maybe uh, actually we say something so outrageous that people start to walk out and I'll suddenly <laughs> back and then we'll give you an opportunity to be involved. Um, we've got three panel members today. Uh, in the middle here, our, our official outsider today is, is Robert Frommer, who's an attorney at the Institute for Justice, which is a public interest law firm devoted to protecting Americans' constitutional rights. He is a uh, really a constitutional lawyer. This is his area of expertise. Um, he's currently lead counsel in a lawsuit challenging Chicago's food truck laws, writes briefs to the Supreme Court in defense of free speech, works to protect individuals' private property from civil forfeiture. And he's appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and Chicago Tribune. Um, seated next to him is Ashley Warnick. Uh, some of you know Ashley. She's an assistant professor uh, teaching economics here at Carroll Community College. Uh, prior to coming to Carroll, Dr. Warnick was visiting associate professor of law at George Mason University Law School, and her scholarly works include articles on the constitutionality of religious accommodation laws. Um, Dr. Warnick received her PhD from George Mason University and JD from the University of Michigan Law School. Uh, so she's way overeducated. Uh, she happens to be both a lawyer and an economist, which is a, Kind of a dangerous thing. <laughs> uh, as, uh, uh, just for disclosure's sake here, I will indicate that actually the two of them are actually legally married uh, and, and seem to like each other and all that. So, and, uh, yeah, let's not go that far. But yeah. let's, let's not say they agree on everything. And, uh, and uh, Rob also has a, a background in economics, also, so he's dangerous in that respect. And the thread here today as Bob Young, who some of you know because you may have had him as a faculty member, is a longtime member of the faculty here, teaches history, and is chair of the humanities department. He also has a master's degree in economics, so I don't talk economics with any of these people. Um, from Binghamton University, it has his PhD in history from Maryland College Park. So um, we've got some varying perspectives here on, on how we view the Constitution, and I'm just going to throw some questions out at them. And, see what they think. I'm going to start with the most generic of questions. You know, could you describe, you know, what the Constitution means to you and why you think the Constitution is important in our daily lives? So, anybody who wants to jump in and start? Yeah. Um, the Constitution is probably, our Constitution is something unique among the world. It's the first, that, at least that I, I know, a uh, charter uh, that's written out that is meant principally to protect individuals' rights. The rights that we have are not, do not flow from the Constitution. The Constitution does not give us those rights, but it affirms that those rights exist, and that we, and that the government, there are certain spheres of action that the government simply may not encroach upon. Uh, some of those are things that you've heard about, like freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion, uh, free to be secure in your homes, but it also means other things like uh, the, the, your right to have private property, your right to uh, engage in a lawful occupation uh, without being subjected to arbitrary government restrictions, and a whole host of other rights. The Constitution is a charter that is meant to protect our rights against the tyranny 
uh, majorities. Uh, democracy is a great thing, uh, popular will is a great thing, but there are certain spheres in which we simply say, the government can go this far and no farther. This is an area that is meant solely for the individual. And that's, uh, and trying to protect those rights is what I do at the Institute for Justice. Okay, good, nice intro there. Uh, who wants to follow that? Yeah, I think, um, just to expand on what Rob said, I mean, if you think of the world where we have all the rights to do whatever we want. I mean, the Constitution in a way just says, except for these things that we've said that government has the power to do. Um, so it, the rest of the world is still our individual rights. Um, it's only those enumerated rights of what government has to do. Now, in Supreme Court's history, um, some of those, what seemingly be, would look like obvious enumerated rights, um, that would limit government's power have kind of been expanded so that we get more government than maybe our founders originally intended um, when they wrote the document. But the idea at heart again is that we have the right to do something unless government was given the power to curtail that right. Um, one of the interesting things from a historical perspective um, is when the Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution. The Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Um, and actually, originally there were 12 proposed amendments. Um, and actually the first one, which we think of as like the best because it's first, free speech, freedom of religion, freedom of press, that was actually the third on the list. Um, but yeah, it still ended up first because the first two didn't get passed right away. Um, so anyway, those 10 amendments, um, when they were debating whether to add them, there was a real concern that by saying people have a right to free speech, people have a right to uh, freedom of the press, that you were going to, that that was going to suggest that we didn't have this whole other world of rights that the Constitution intended us to have. And maybe that's what we come to now is where we are really saying, well, unless it's enumerated somewhere in the Bill of Rights, then you don't have that right. So maybe we've turned a, a corner in the sense of how we view the Constitution um, as far as limiting the role of government as opposed to limiting our, our rights. Well, excuse me, but except for there's, there's one passage in the Constitution that says unless these rights, unless these um, uh, powers are enumerated in the Constitution, they're, re they're retained by the states and, and the people. or the people. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there can be any confusion about about, uh, about famously, what, you know, yeah, Judge Wark famously yeah, referred to that as an ink spot in yeah. the Constitution that we should just completely yeah. ignore. Yeah, what Ashley was uh, just mentioning, this fear that, uh, that some of the founding fathers had that if we enumerate certain rights in the Constitution, maybe others will uh, be thought of as not existing there. That fear came out, has become the case, as Ashley mentioned, as Dr. Wark mentioned. Uh, as my wife mentioned. Judge Bork, who was a, a, a judge on the DC Circuit, the second highest court in the land, and was actually nominated to the US Supreme Court, famously called the Ninth Amendment, the uh, language that you're talking about, an ink blot. He said, I don't know what this means, and therefore I will not enforce it at all uh, as a member of the judge. And there's a number of judges who, uh, this is an entire school of thought, that unless the Constitution specifically enumerates a right, like the like freedom of speech, uh, we are simply going to not assume that it exists. Uh, and what that has had the consequence for, unfortunately, uh, is that in vast spheres of our daily lives, we have ceded incredible ground to the government to be able to uh, interfere with our activities, even if, going back to the original idea of the Constitution, they shouldn't have constitutionally had the power to do that. Well, yeah. well yeah. that's the yeah. 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 back because, uh, you know, what, there's a couple things that whenever they go back to founding fathers get me thinking. Uh, is for one thing, um, I'll, I'll students they'll ask me, like, what would, what do I think the founding fathers, can you put them up on such a pedestal with that title? Uh, yeah, uh, and you gotta remember it was 55 white guys with lots of property who did this. And, uh, I'll get asked, what do you think they would think if they could see us today? And my honest answer that I've always given for all the years I've been here is, I think they'd be surprised we were still here. Uh, I don't think they were, they were looking down 200 and some years uh, with, and, or with the, had the idea that like every word that they wrote or said was going to be like it was in the Bible or something. 
Uh, and uh, the, 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 the times when they put this together, uh, if you ever read about the actual debates and the alliances and the people who walked out, I mean, they were also 55 politicians. Uh, and, you know, for people who have issues with Congress today, uh, I mean, the, the things that they were discussing, um, you know, even in terms of having the Bill of Rights and those amendments, which a lot of states, you know, James Madison, who's usually thought of as the father of the Constitution, had to, in a way, agree, yes, we'll do some amendments, but he was terrified at the fact that there were people who looked at the Constitution and said, oh, well, this isn't right, we need another convention. And they were like, do you realize how hard it was to do one convention, let alone if we have another one? Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, we have a tendency to look at it like it's some, again, like holy bit or something, but it's like anything else. These, they were not some kind of, I don't know, like, you know, they, they, were, they were men. Yeah, they were they men. They're not philosophers. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, but... I, I think they get their due, right. mostly because the document has survived so much yeah. longer than maybe even they intended. And I mean, it's certainly the Civil War and slavery was a real challenge to the document's right. um, durability. And yet the Constitution, right side one, but yet the Constitution was able to be amended in a way, such a way that we, um, maybe not, we kept that from becoming a continuing issue. Well, and because even then, as I, as I said, you, you particularly see this in the, through like the 1800s, uh, they would talk about a strict construction of the Constitution and a loose construction of the Constitution. And like when Alexander Hamilton was George Washington's Secretary of the Treasury, and he had all these things, we, we, we want to have a bank, we want to have tariffs, we want to have all these things. Uh, Madison is, and I imagine, I always said there was a senator from West Virginia, Robert Byrd, who carried the Constitution in his pocket. Oh, we got the Constitution. Yes, and he would pull it out. And what I love to watch him when he was on C-SPAN, because even if it was something he would support, he would say, I fear we are moving too swiftly here. And then he'd talk for six hours. Uh, but uh, I imagine Madison on the floor of the House of Representatives when Hamilton presented these things, pulling it out and saying, show me where it says you can have a bank. It's not in there. And Hamilton's response would have been, like, Mr. Madison, do you possibly think we could have thought of everything we were going to need for decades and centuries in that room in Philadelphia in 1787? And see, so right from the start, you have people thinking, well, and this is going to sound, you know, let's get it carefully because there's a difference here. Because what Madison said at the time was, unless the Constitution says you can do it, then you can't. And Hamilton said, unless the Constitution says you can't do it, then you can. And those are two totally different things. And I thought that was like ancient history, but then I remember in 2000 when Governor Bush was running against Al Gore, then Governor Bush, Governor Bush, in one of the debates, he said, I'm a strict constructionist of the Constitution. And I was blown away by that. But we were all around for the Bush administration. Was he a strict constructionist or a loose constructionist? Once push came, because circumstances change. Certainly after 9-11, yeah, that constitution flexes a lot more then. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's I, I like to th think that it's, it's got to be seen as a living, breathing thing. That, that, that well, they, they couldn't have thought of everything 200 years well, ago. Well, I think and they understood that they couldn't think of everything, which is why they built the amendment process into the constitution. And before we had a court that was more aggressive in interpreting the Constitution, we had more amendments. That's we true. would have the amendment process. Now it's much more expedient if you want to have the Constitution interpreted in a different way. I mean, it's not an easy process, but it's much more likely to succeed by going to the Supreme Court and having them do it for you than actually trying to hold a constitutional convention. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, that's a great segue on my second question for me. I find some of our students have trouble relating to the Constitution, but they see things going on more recently with the Supreme Court. And they see potentially that having some impact on their lives. So I'm thinking of recent cases that address same-sex marriage, the Affordable Care Act, sometimes known as Obamacare. Um, what do you guys view as the significance of not only those cases, but recent court cases 
how they've been interpreted and what that means to our students in terms of the way they live their lives. Well, the impact of the Supreme Court on sort of the Constitution, on the, how, how the Constitution inter, interacts with our life can't be, uh, can't be overstated. Uh, for instance, the, the gay marriage case uh, and the reason it is the culmination of uh, what Ashley was talking about a second ago, which is the if, through how the, difficult the amendment process is, that sometimes it's easier to try to persuade the Supreme Court to change sort of the law of the land. For a number of years, uh, homosexual relations were prescribable under state law. Uh, there are anti-sami laws in a number of states, and what happened is through a, a long series of strategic uh, series of cases, uh, advocates pushed the court first to say that those kinds of laws, anti-sami laws, are unconstitutional, and then culminating all the way up in last uh, year's same-sex decision. All that's born out of one provision of the Constitution called substantive due process. Uh, and it shows that the Constitution, it, while it is, uh, it, it the, is given it's the not language, open. given the language sure. of the of that part of the Fourteenth Amendment, and see if any of them. I mean, there, there's a not not to single out gay, same sex marriage, but I mean, there's a lot of things we consider our civil rights and our um, our civil rights um, that come out of this language. And if you just read the language, it might not jump out at you that that's what how this would evolve. Yeah, so it'll say that the 14th Amendment, and I'm going to paraphrase here, because that uh, the privileges, uh, the, every individual citizen of a state or is a citizen of the United States and has the privileges or immunities so, uh, that go along with that. It also says that uh, no one shall be deprived of life, liberty, uh, or property without due process of law, and that all people shall be uh, shall benefit from under the equal protection of the laws. These are vague concepts, uh, admittedly vague concepts. They are not, uh, how they apply in any particular situation, uh, the Constitution doesn't lay that out. But what I think the Constitution ultimately you have to see it as is a, is a, instead of saying, it's not a prolix code, that's uh, actually something that our, one of our uh, first uh, chief justices called, uh, said in a, a very famous case called Marvin v. Madison, uh, which established the idea that the Supreme Court was the one who just said what was constitutional, what was not. But instead, the Constitution is a set of principles, uh, general principles that are meant to uh, constrain both, uh, constrain the scope of government and also to ascribe, at least it, maybe not exhaustively, but some key areas where we are supposed to have uh, freedom of action uh, where the government's not supposed to uh, tread. Well, I was just thinking. <laughs> I was, what I was just thinking when you said about because, of course, the Fourteenth Amendment was is like the Civil Rights Amendment, and it was passed yeah. in the aftermath of the Civil War. So that's dealing with the, the former slaves, and uh, there's even something in there declaring the Connecticut, Connecticut, the Confederate debt null and void. Yeah. You know, yeah. as well. So it's really of its time. Um, there's lots of stuff in the Fourteenth. I mean, yeah. the Fourteenth Amendment. I mean, it not only uh, dealt with the immediate issue of slavery, right. but you know, out of the Fourteenth Amendment, and well, out of the Fourteenth Amendment, that's where a lot of the the, the gay rights and the right sex privacy. marriage, the the right to privacy, partly comes out yeah. of that. That's all part of the penumbra of the first and the fourth right. and the fifth, um, the third, which yeah. is often overlooked. And I, no, no soldiers in my house, please. <laughs> I think one thing that's sort of, uh, I think it's something that historically is very uh, fascinating about the 14th Amendment and the 13th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, basically the, the post-Civil War Amendments, is they fundamentally changed, in some way, the nature of the Constitution. Up until the Civil War, the Constitution was thought of primarily as a tool to constrain the federal government. In other words, it dealt with the limiting the powers of the federal government. It didn't touch upon the states. In fact, uh, many people said that states, uh, uh, even after the passage of the Constitution before the Civil War, could establish uh, their own state churches. Because after all, the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment says no co Congress shall not uh, create a, a state uh, a government sponsored religion. You have not established a religion. It doesn't say anything about the state. But after the Civil War, with the passage of the 14th Amendment, for the first time you saw the Constitution directly saying, not only to the federal government, to state governments, 
there are certain things you cannot do. There are certain things you cannot do to your citizens. And that's why, even though it is of its time, the 14th Amendment is of its time, it is, at least in my job, what probably the primary mechanism by which I work and where I work, my Institute for Justice, where I work, where we work to uh, roll back uh, overreaching government actions. Most of my cases are not against the federal government. In fact, uh, uh, like, like you said, I, I'm lead counsel against the city, uh, a lawsuit in Chicago. I uh, had a lawsuit against Arlington County. Often my lawsuits are against state and local governments because that's often where we find the government overreach being the most egregious. And the most impactful on people's lives. Yes. Well, and another thing that came to mind in, in talking about the language and stuff like that, uh, because when we you we were the first ones to write this down to, to, to you know right. I, I I make a joke you know if you want to be like a bad American tourist go to London England and ask where you go to see the English <laughs> Constitution <laughs> they'll know you're a dumb tourist because you can't just go to the Ar National Archives and see it there but uh, after us the whole world like becomes frantic Constitution writers <laughs> if you ever get to look at it the Soviet Union had a wonderful Constitution. It was beautiful. It had all these rights and things in it, but it wasn't worth the paper it was printed on. So, as important as the paper is, it's also the process and the, the way the leaders going forward actually treat the document, too. Uh, it's and this raises an interesting point. I think, I'm sure you've all heard the term like judicial activism. Um, <coughs> you know, uh, people getting up and saying the Supreme Court was activist either because it did something, they upheld Obamacare, or they uh, uh, passed Citizens United and allowed corporations to speak. Uh, you hear this all the you time. Contributions. No, to actually independent speech. Um, and that uh, you hear this phrase a lot. And usually what it means is that the po whatever person talking just doesn't like the decision that, that came out. It isn't really a meaningful phrase. But what is important, I was talking about this a little bit earlier, and you mentioned this about how many other co uh, countries have these grand constitutions that don't really right. mean anything. And that's because what happens is that you're only as good, the words on the paper don't matter. What matters at the end of the day is somebody willing to stand up and put real limits to put these words into action. And what we, and what we have seen for at least the past 70 years in this country, is there's been an ongoing trend, an ongoing uh, idea that the judiciary, the judges, the people who are actually supposed to be deciding whether things are constitutional or not, are supposed to, they're told that they are supposed to defer to the other branches. Uh, that they, uh, judicial deference, judicial abdication, that they shouldn't uh, be uh, forceful in uh, limiting the, the, the the actions of the other two branches of the government, the legislative and the executive. And now the problem with that is that when you don't place, you don't actually enforce meaningful limits on those other branches, then the next thing you have is those other branches go to whatever they want. And what we know from economics uh, is that when the government acts, or uh, when the, principally when the government acts, it will act to try to benefit some groups at the expense of other groups. Usually small, uh, concentrated groups are able to extract benefits from the government. And so we see this again and again. I see this again and again in my, in my work. Uh, for instance, we brought a lawsuit in Louisiana. Louisiana is the only state in the country that licensed florists. There you had to go and pass a test. And you, not only that, you had to sit down and arrange some flowers, and your competitors got to decide whether you arranged them well enough or not. We brought suit against that, said that's unconstitutional. And the state of Louisiana came back and said, well, we need this law because after all, there might be infected dirt. There might be infected dirt, and if people don't get licenses as florists, maybe that infected dirt will kill somebody. It sounds like Louisiana. <laughs> and under the Constitution, we actually had to try to convince a court that there was no such thing as infected dirt. Of course, there wasn't. And unfortunately, we lost that case, and as a result, our client, I hate to say it, she lost her job, she, she died in poverty. So these having judges who are willing to actually stand up and take the Constitution seriously, take their roles as judges seriously, and meaningfully enforce those limits, 
is crucial if we're going to have a constitution that's more than just a bunch of words on a piece of paper. Well, and that's when you said to take the role as judges seriously, because one of the things that we, I think we also forget for periods of time, and then a decision comes out and we're reminded, because like you said, it, 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 what, whether they're activists or not depends on whether you agree with them, but we, we think that there are these nine people in these robes who are just going to unbiasedly decide the constant. They're Republicans and Democrats like everybody else. They all get appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate because they have a particular ideology. And you know, it, 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 and once in a while, a, a, a case comes down that just seems so blatantly, well, the Democrats did this, the Republicans did that. And then it's like, oh, gee, they're not these wonderful. Well, I think as human beings, you know, like us up here, you know, we all have our ideas about how the Constitution should be interpreted. And the Constitution is vague enough that you can have your interpretation yeah. and I can have mine. And we don't know who's right, but right. neither one of us is wrong. Right. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, it's not surprising to see them apply yeah. their own lens right. uh, into their constitutional interpretation. Well, because like in the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare thing, you had predictably, uh, it was, it's a 5-4 decision. The, the, the four conservatives, the four liberals, and Judge Roberts makes the decision, the Chief Justice. And I remember reading at the time. Anybody that, watched the debate last night, that's what, that's what Senator Cruz was going and on and on about how John it's Roberts was done. Done. because of that decision. Yeah, and it was like, but I, I found interesting when I was reading the, and not being a legal historian or anything like that, reading them say that he was trying to decide on what was best for the court going forward, rather that, that it, would, it would have been looked so blatantly political if he had voted to overturn it, that he was thinking of the future of the court. I thought that was interesting. And that, that is, uh, I mean, I'm, I don't know whether he did that in that particular case, it's quite possible, but it definitely has a historical precedent. Back in the early days of the New Deal, back in the early 1930s, right. the Supreme Court was uh, much, very, very skeptical of a lot of the uh, laws that Congress and FDR were passing, a lot of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the various uh, trade protections, jobs programs, and struck some of them down, saying that they were unconstitutional, that the, court, that the Congress had exceeded its authority. And, but then magically, right around, around 1937, the court did what is known as the switch in, uh, switch in time saves nine. After Roosevelt had gotten reelected in 36, he got on uh, the air, the radio at the time, and basically floated the idea of packing the Supreme Court, putting six new justices up there. Uh, and what that would have done is fundamentally changed the court. And so there's, there's some evidence that suggests that the court seeing this and worrying about its institutional existence uh, switched how it uh, switched some of its key decisions in ways that were more favorable to the administration. So that happens constantly. They, it, it's exactly right. They're not nine philosopher kings up on one first street. There are people who have they have their personal interests, they have their institutional interests, and they also have an interest in trying to do what they think is correct under the Constitution as well. But that means that. It's not as simple, there's no computer where I can plug everything in and tell you how the Supreme Court's gonna turn out in any given case. Well, just to, to relate to, I mean, not to make any suggestions about you guys, but um, those cases um, coming out of FDR, coming after Lochner, those cases, um, especially the ones that expanded the, the scope of the Commerce Clause, um, which is what a lot of these programs rely on, is uh, that Congress has the, should have the ability to regulate commerce between the several states. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was the hook. The, where, is your, where is your power to do this, Congress? Oh, there it is, okay. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of our civil rights come out of that. Um, a lot of those agencies live because of that Commerce Clause. And you know, just a few years ago, what is it now, 10, um, there was a case that involved uh, marijuana. And it was a completely in-state operation in California. Marijuana was grown in California. It was used in California. Um, so the, they, the some people said that this should not be subject to federal law. 
It's not crossing state lines. It's not interstate commerce. And the court said, yeah, it's good enough. Um, we're going to rely on these 1930s cases, uh, which held basically that a corn farmer can not grow corn, even though it's his corn for his table, if we've got a national program that limits corn production. So those cases in the 1930s, which may or may not have been in result of the fear of the courts losing its integrity, um, still continue net today. I mean, that's still law. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk Kim Davis. All right. Okay. I'm curious as to your reaction to, uh, I think everybody's aware we had a clerk of court in Kentucky that decided she's not going to hand out uh, marriage license to same-sex couples. We had a Supreme Court case that we already referred to. We've got religious freedom issues. We've got, uh, is the Supreme Court the law of the land, which I think some Republican candidates have suggested it's not, or they implied that, you know, it's not the law. So what's your, what's your take on this? I think this is one issue that probably all of you have run into recently and are maybe wondering what would these folks think of this case? The Supreme, whether you agree or not with the recent uh, same-sex marriage decision out of the Supreme Court, it is the law of the land. What the Supreme Court said is that uh, restrictions uh, in state laws that prohibit people the same sex from getting married, uh, from applying for and receiving marriage licenses violates the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, and therefore the government simply can't do that. That is law. That binds every single government employee after that, and including Kim Davis. Now, I understand that Kim Davis, and I'm speaking here as more as myself rather than a, a attorney for IJ, but Kim Davis is a government employee. She took the, she was elected to the job, but her, the job description that she ran for was to uh, to issue marriage licenses, in part to issue marriage licenses to people who are entitled to them under the law. She has a legal duty to perform the functions of her office. If she does not do so, she is always free to leave that office. And so I, this is me again, me personally, I think that there is a, while maybe a private individual, and Ashley can probably talk about some of these cases, might be able to say that they should have a religious exemption or also what's known as a free exercise right to not have to do certain things or not have to serve maybe certain customers. That's, it's fundamentally different when one is, someone is a private business owner versus when, one, when that person is a function and arm of the state. At that point, they have a duty under, the, they've sworn a duty to execute those laws. And if they're not willing to do that, then they have a simple option, which is resign. I mean, I think if you, if you take it out of um, the more contentious issue of same-sex marriage, and look at a lot of other Supreme Court decisions that have uh, really solidified different civil rights for different minority groups, if somebody at you know at a voting booth in South Carolina, just a voting official, just said, you know, I'm just not going to let black people vote, we would think that was atrocious, and we'd throw that person in jail, and nobody would think twice about it. We'd have a parade when we put them in jail, right? But here, this is the, basically the same thing. The law says she has to issue the licenses. She refuses to issue the licenses. She is the government. The government is saying basically through her, we are not going to abide by our own law. We're going to treat some people differently than others despite the fact that our law, now thanks to the Supreme Court, is pretty clear on what we're supposed to be doing. Um, because she's a government official, she doesn't get to pick and choose which laws she's gonna abide by and which ones she's not. Now, I think that it would be a different situation, and we still haven't completely tested this out in the court, so I don't wanna make, make you think that I'm spouting precedent here, but we run into a different collision of constitutional rights when we take Kim Davis out of the, the sphere of a government employee when Kim Davis is, say, a baker in New Mexico who doesn't want to have to bake a cake for a gay wedding because he or she has a religious objection to gay weddings. You're running right there smack into the 14th Amendment civil right of the gay couple to be served by the baker, to have the, the, you know, the, go to, uh, participate in that kind of business, buy from that business, and the baker's right to exercise his religion as he sees fit. Um, so you've you got that tension, and where we've, run into that tension before has been mostly with religious organizations. So for instance, we have a very broadly sweeping anti-discrimination employment law that says you can't discriminate against women in, in employment. 
We don't apply that law to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is absolutely 100% allowed to say women can't be priests. Um, because we've said that to do otherwise would be the court telling the Catholic Church how to be Catholic. And that is just absolutely unacceptable when you're talking about establishment of religion and allowing free exercise. So the question is, is you know, clearly we've got on the one hand, Kim Davis, government employee, can't use her religious um, her religious beliefs in order to uh, not abide by the law. We were going to give an accommodation to something that's clearly a religious belief, a religious institution like the Catholic Church. What do we do about the guy in the middle, the New Mexico baker? Right. So that's where we've got, I think, the future of some of these cases and figuring out exactly where one person's right stops and the other one begins. Now, are, are you guys surprised that actually, other than the Kim Davis case, there haven't been a lot of visible cases where people have refused to abide by the court's decision. And some people have actually been surprised that there hasn't been more civil disobedience or I think times change pretty fast. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, as, as far as uh, popular perceptions of, uh, of uh, same-sex marriage, I mean, I think you could say the same thing about marijuana use. I mean, times, people's perceptions change very fast, and one of the things the court is essentially doing is keeping up, um, which, you know, whether you think that's an activist court or, you know, a court that's overstepping its bounds, I mean, it is in some sense reflecting some public opinion there. I mean, maybe if we did the uh, marijuana case again 10 years later, maybe we'd get a different result. Because yeah, right. I've always been, as a person that grew up in the South, we had Brown versus Board of Education. And trust me, I went to schools for years that were fully segregated mm -hmm. after that. It wasn't like, and these are all elected officials in many cases, or government officials saying, well, that's nice, but our schools are still going to be black and white, and we'll bust the black kids right past the white school. Now, eventually the federal courts changed that, and schools were desegregated, but that's a case where it took a long time for people to respond, and that, so that's why I thought the, on the same-sex marriage and some other things, it might be slower, but it, why yeah, was that so slow then? And Bob probably knows a lot of that. Well, I think it is a large part to do with the history. Uh, please go ahead. I mean, I have massive resistance, as they call it, yeah. and, and I think there was something, I, I, I think it's just a different, this is a tough one because I think on the one hand, one of the worries that Southern whites always had, there was just something about, I mean, and this was an image that they had ingrained in their prejudice for years of a, a predatory black male. I mean, you go back to colonial days, the most dangerous thing on the plantation, as far as they were concerned, was a black teenage boy. And the thought of having them in the classroom next to, as they put on a pedestal, the Daughters of Dixie, that was something, it was almost a visceral response they had. And I, I, don't, I don't think you're getting that from someone who has the warped idea that, oh my gosh, someone's gonna turn my child gay. You know, that, that, that's not on the same level of intensity. I, I think it also might just be with, um, if, if you're in the 1950s South, um, you know whether you have a friend who is black. And you know whether you don't have a friend who is black. But if you're in year 2015, Carroll County, you really don't know if somebody's gay or somebody's not gay. So when somebody who you've worked with, trusted, confided in, considered you know, a good person, turns out they're gay or straight or whatever, then you're like, oh, well, maybe they're not so bad. Yeah. You know, but you don't ever get to that step in 1950 yeah. South Carolina because right. you're not having the black people over for dinner. Yeah, I remember my mother at one point, uh, she passed away last year, but uh, raised Episcopalian, and she would tell me about this nice gay couple who comes to church and Robbie, they're so nice. These, these, it was almost like these, these gay people were okay because they were coming to church. It was like, yes, but gay people do go to church. It's, it's okay, it's okay. She thought it was so cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing that I do see uh, um, is um, a steady encroachment by the federal government, like using the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. So, um, you know, the traditional powers, police powers of the state included health, safety, welfare, and morals, right? So that covers a whole lot of local jurisdictional matter. And now we've got a system where basically 
our, I see our federated structure as uh, going away. We, we're basically going to be, and depending upon what cases the Supreme Court decides to give certiorari to, we're arriving at a, at a, at a system that's going to be totally overwhelmed by the federal government. And I'd like to know where the line of demarcation with regard to the traditional police powers of the state and the federal government are anymore. Because I don't, I just see it just, I see it total, a total uh, flood of the, of the dark. Well, I think one thing to note, and I, I'm going to turn it a little bit, is that the expansion, and uh, we were talking about this a bit before, beginning with the New Deal, the expansion of what is thought of uh, as being a power that the federal government possesses has expanded enormously since the 1930s. And so what we have seen increasingly is for the federal government to be getting involved in activities that traditionally were left to the states uh, in a number of areas. Uh, so that's one aspect. Uh, but as another, going to more to your point, you say that the police power, I agree with you that the police power is traditionally about health and safety. That's actually one of the things that I always argue in my case, that the role of government is to protect our health and safety. And as long as there's evidence that it's actually doing so, that regulation's fine. I, I would push back a little on the idea that I understand some people was historically say that it was for morals. But the court, and I think most people have moved away from that over time, saying, because the idea of saying that the government, that the police power encourages, it, it allows for the government to legislate morality, then really puts this total sphere, uh, it allows for the, for the state government to regulate all aspects of your life. Because of course, 50 plus 50% 50 plus 1% of your state might think whatever you're doing is immoral. And therefore, they have a legitimate way to they have a legitimate right to keep you from doing that immoral thing. So I think it's important to conceive of the police power as just as constraining those actions by you that can have a palpable effect on a third party, on someone else that can harm someone else's health or safety. But just that the the mere fact that they might not like what you're doing, but it doesn't demonstrably harm them anyway. I would say that at least in the modern views of the police power, that I, I think that is less prevalent now than it used to be. Yeah. Justice Breyer just wrote a book about the importance of understanding international law and interpreting the U.S. Constitution. So what are your thoughts on that? Not a fan. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think the Constitution and the U.S. government, we have sovereignty and we have not ceded that sovereignty to any international body. And even in terms of when we enter into treaties, um, like from an economic standpoint, the World Trade Organization, at any point we can just say, nope, we're just not going to do that anymore. We just, no, we are in it as long as it's good for us, and every other country is in it as long as it's good for them, and when it's no longer good for them, we're done. Um, that is not the way that our, that, that's not the way that I think about law. Um, law to me constrains your actions whether you like it or not. You don't have the ability to say, yeah, I'm just not going to pay attention to that one today. Right? But I think that is what we can do in, um, in terms of treaties where there really is not some overarching government that is uh, going to lay down, going to use force in order to enforce those laws. So, I'm, anyway, I'm going to disagree. I'm always going to disagree. I'm going to disagree with you here. Because, well, yes, I agree with you, the concept, the, the idea of, yes, we will, I'll use the idea of foreign law rather than okay. international law to avoid the problem that you're talking about. I think that there is some degree, some role for looking at and interpreting foreign law and when interpreting the U.S. Constitution. Not that it binds us, not that it actually controls what the Constitution says, but there's a number of provisions in the U.S. Constitution that are intentionally vague. Uh, the one that comes to mind the, 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 right off the top of my head is the cruel or unusual punishment of the Eighth Amendment. Well, and of course then the question becomes, well, what in the world are we supposed to, what is cruel or unusual? Uh, do we simply define that by what someone said right at the founding, what they thought was cruel and unusual? Uh, or is it instead supposed to be a more open inquiry as to that what is cruel and unusual in light of our current sort of moral situation? And if it's the latter, and I think it is, then 
the, those foreign laws and what they say about other civilized nations and how they approach problems can have not controlling effect on our, our decisions, but can inform us about what things, uh, what, on what side of the line a particular punishment lies. So it's just, it's, it's mostly um, persuasive, but not. Yes, persuasive, but not binding authority. Um, I'd like to take advantage of the fact that Bob is here. You, um, you work with an organization that's concerned about kind of the intrusion of government or overregulation, those kind of things. Could you give some examples? Because you mentioned that's not always happening at the federal level. It may be there, but it could also be at state and local level in terms of property rights and those kind of things. What are the kinds of things your organization works on, and how does those things impact, say, our students in their daily lives? If we regulate forests in the forest in Louisiana, that's one thing, but are things like that happening in Maryland or other places that where we should be concerned about? Absolutely. Uh, one of the like uh, you mentioned uh, uh, in, in introducing me that I'm the lead attorney on our case in Chicago, challenging parts of Chicago's food truck laws. There's a reason, uh, and, and what those specifically what those laws say is that uh, all the food trucks in Chicago uh, have cannot be within 200 feet of any restaurant whatsoever. And they all have to be equipped with GPS tracking devices so that the government can monitor everywhere they go. And we see those laws <coughs> over and over again in different places throughout the country. Uh, we're working on a case where it's 300 feet from a business with, that sells the same or similar product as the food truck. Other places we challenged, it was 1,000 feet from a restaurant. Those laws, those kinds of restrictions exist, as you might expect, to protect the restaurants from competition from food trucks. And what we argue is that that's not a legitimate role of government, came back to my point earlier, that the role of government is supposed to be about protecting health and safety, not about protecting certain businesses from competition from other people after work. After all, basically, I think competition's the American way, like competition, gets us better products at lower prices. That kind of, those kinds of laws are the things that we, that have a direct effect on your lives. I don't know if there are, how many food trucks are here in, uh, in Carroll County. I, I, I don't think there's very many. I know that there's uh, a relatively, it, uh, over in Baltimore, there's a relatively few number of food trucks. And that's because the laws there are very bad. Whereas in DC, where I'm from, there are a lot of food trucks. And that's because I and the food truck associations work to repeal and keep those unconstitutional laws from being passed. These laws have a direct effect on all innumerable facets of your daily lives that you can, sometimes you can see directly, and other times it's, it, you, it's just that you won't miss the absence of something that isn't there because of a bad law, but it's still affecting your life. And you know that's the kind of thing that uh, I, I work to try to eliminate. Tell me about uh, uh, taxis in Las Vegas. You tell me, uh, which one? Uh, the, the original? <laughs> Okay. Well, they, they've also done some um, cases challenging taxi monopolies by, um, there are uh, gypsy cabs or other private uh, limos, things like that, who try to run uh, basically taxi services that would compete with the existing taxi companies. The cities, um, for the most part, fought uh, letting these people come in and run these operations, despite the fact that it, pretty much to a one, they could meet the same requirements, the safety requirements. Um, as far as the taxi medallion owners did, but um, the city was ba the cities in this case it was Las Vegas were trying to ensure that they that their chosen um, chosen uh, companies were the only ones who could have taxis. Now anybody who's taken economics knows what happens when you reduce supply; prices go up, right? And prices go up and quantity goes down. So you know you go to New York City in the days before Uber and try to catch a cab. Good luck, especially if it's raining or if you're a minority. Forget it. Um, there's no cab for you, and partly that's because the city has restricted the availability of these taxi cab medallions by and restricting supply. So it makes you worse off in the sense that it's harder to get a cab, and the cab is more expensive. Um, but you might not notice it because. Well, that's just the way it is in New York City, right? And it's really not until Uber has really come in and try to challenge that whole market structure um, that we are starting to see, well, maybe, maybe there was a better way to do this than to have 
uh, you know, um, taxi cab medallions where only certain companies were allowed to run cabs. Yeah, to, to play the other side of that, if, if Bob rents me a room in his house, should I, is there a health and safety argument that there's no regulation of that and compared to a motel or hotel or? This, uh, but this is actually, uh, we've been having, I, uh, we've been talking with people. Uh, I, 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 some have some of you heard of the website Airbnb. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually have conversations. Airbnb with, basically yeah, you can rent you. out a room in your house, or you can rent a room in somebody else's house. Um, I'm not sure that there's much of a market for Airbnb in Carroll County, um, but uh, you know, as far as like a big event is going on in D.C. or in Baltimore, and lots of people want to be in Baltimore, and there aren't very many hotel rooms available, people will start renting out their you know, a spare bedroom. Um, I've heard of people who actually take their vacation and at times when there's gonna be a big event near their house, they take their vacation, they go off to Spain or something and they rent out their house for a whole lot of money during that, that event and that pays for their vacation. That happened during the London Olympics. So what happens yes. uh, is that, so you have like Airbnb and you you have these people who, uh, who want to rent rooms. I want to rent a room to you and you want to, rent it for me, that's great. And sure, the government has some, uh, to the extent that there are actual demonstrable health or safety issues that we can point to. Yes, the government has a role, a legitimate role to regulate, to be involved there. But what we have seen over and over again is that in a number of places, what they have done is instead of saying, well, we're gonna make sure we're gonna come in, we're gonna inspect to make sure that the room is safe. What they've done is they've flatly banned short-term rentals, Airbnb, from even existing. And the reason for that is because the hotels, the hotel lobby pushes hard to make short-term rentals illegal. And why do they do that? Because it's the competition. Because they don't like to have the competition from Airbnb and from all those individuals. So they go to the government. This is back to what I was talking about before, about uh, interest groups and I have interest groups going to government. The hotel industry went to the government and says, we don't like this competition, so please make my competition legal. And so they get, a, and the legislators, because the legislators say, sure, they write a law, getting rid of Airbnb, and uh, as a result, the hotels are better off, and maybe the politicians are better off because we're getting contributions from the hotels, but everyone who would have rented out their room or wanting to find a cheaper room, uh, now is left with one less option. And is that kind of self-dealing, or a dealing where, where the government is handing out benefits and burdens to favored industries that is pernicious, and that's that's the kind of thing that we, we fight against, uh, we bring lawsuits against. There can be legitimate, there can be legitimate reasons for um, requiring you know, different health inspections or safety inspections. But we also have to, I think what Rob's trying to say is we have to be cognizant that there are other motivations um, for the government to pass these types of laws. I mean, one of the big complaints about Airbnb it, uh, from a, a legislator standpoint, a city standpoint, is not so much that it's not safe. I mean, if you look at the uh, track records of Airbnb, it's pretty safe. Um, people get mugged and robbed in hotels far more frequently than they do in Airbnb. If I'm renting out my room, I have a big incentive to not have you be robbed in my house because um, if you're robbed in my house, you know who I am, yeah. right? And I would like future customers and I'm probably not gonna get a five-star review from you if you got robbed in my house. So I, I have a pretty strong incentive not to rob you um, already that may, not, may or may not exist with all the staff in a hotel. Um, so anyway, they, they may have a legitimate interest, but when you look at what the cities mostly are complaining about with Airbnb, it's not the lack of safety, it's the lack of tax revenue. Um, so if Airbnb and all the people who are renting out those rooms and money's exchanging hand and they're not paying their, you know, the king's ransom to the, the pound of flesh to the king, um, that's what they're upset about. So uh, it is tax revenue, tax generation, um, a real legitimate interest to really harm consumers? I don't really think so. Uh, so you guys are making it sound like economics are driving a lot of court decisions. I'm trying to get more students in your class. Everything, economics is everything, they know that. You can make an economic argument for everything. Uh, <laughs> but what Rob is saying is oftentimes it's the self-interest of these different groups in conflict and yes. you know, the courts are brought in to make a decision and maybe it's health and safety, but maybe it's who's got the market already and doesn't want to lose. Yes. Well, and it's, it's, again, it's this deference to the legislative yeah. process. I mean, these laws were not just, you know, 
handed down from on high. I mean, a legislator, a legislative body, a duly elected legislative body, determined that this was the best thing to do. So what you're asking a court to do, what he's asking a court to do, is to tell the legislature, you step too far. Yep. Okay, we've got a few minutes left here. Anyone have a, a hot question? And I see Karen's in the back there. You've got a quick question here for the group. Well, I just uh, remember what you said about um, the Catholic Church having its own, own area for laws. And uh, it makes me wonder, um, well, especially with the uh, big immigration that's happening from uh, in the Middle East toward the European countries and all that type of thing, um, you know, eventually we will have a, a higher amount of Islamic people in this country. Would it be possible for them to form their own um, area where they would like to have Sharia law? It, is that going to be a possibility in this country? Well, I didn't mean to suggest that, the, the, that there's some statute out there that says these are the laws for the Catholics. I mean, what it really is is that if you are a religious organization, and this is kind of where what defines a religious organization. That's a question the court like absolutely refuses yeah. to answer, um, which is probably a good thing. Um, but anyway, if you are a religious organization and you have a well-defined and generally accepted moral code uh, list of tenets of your religion, um, and you are abiding by them, and by abiding by those core beliefs, that would require you to violate some other law it, for the most part, we have made accommodation for that type of religious practice by a religious organization. So, I mean, one of the first cases that uh, dealt with this was actually um, uh, uh, Church of Latter-day Saints, um, where they had a, uh, there was a janitor who worked in one of their temples, and he didn't have a temple recommend, which basically means you were not in good standing with the church, and they fired him based on religion. And uh, you're not allowed to fire people based on religion, based on under our employment discrimination laws. But they said, look, to get that into, to ask that question about whether it really was important that a janitor be a member in good standing of the church would require the court to get in and decide what are the parts of the church that count and what are the parts of the church that don't count. And we didn't want the church to do that because then essentially what the church is doing is saying, well, this part of your religion is valid, but that part not so much. Right, so we give that kind of accommodation to religious organizations. Now, one problem that arises from this, allowing religious organizations these accommodations is, the more organized your religion is, the easier it is for you to get an accommodation. So if you are, say, a Wiccan tribe, um, which you know, you're pretty far dispersed, um, you, know, you don't have a, a, real, a real organizational structure, it's going to be a lot harder for you to justify your, why you need your accommodation as a religious organization, as opposed to the Catholic Church, which has this beautiful cathedral down the street. So yeah, maybe. Could I just, yeah. one thing in, in that scenario that I described, the, the thing that concerns me most is that under their Sharia law, they are allowed to take the lives of their women. And I just wondered which is going to be which is going to be uppermost that, that, uppermost that in this country. Is it going to be the Sharia law eventually, or is it going to be the U.S. Constitution? The U.S. Constitution. Yeah, you're ne you're never going to be allowed to murder. Yeah, there's an old there's an old set uh, saying, uh, or it's an old story uh, from uh, it's from India, and it was a issue where uh, a man had died and they built a funeral pyre. And the, the village, the Indian village, was about to throw his wife onto the fire. Uh, this is part of the tradition. And the British officer came up and said, what are you doing? And they said, well, it's our tradition that you know, we burn the wife along with the husband on the funeral pyre. And he said, oh, I understand that's your tradition. Well, we have a tradition too, which is to hang people who burn women on funeral pyres. <laughs> so the idea is that and your tradition might have, well all being good, but the, but the Constitution and the law is the law of the land, and to the extent that you're going to try to impose some kind of other restrictions that are in conflict with that, those have to fall by the wayside. I mean, there have been cases where um, uh, universities that claim that have a religious affiliation, for instance, wanted to have a 
basically racially discriminatory policies for their uh, students. They had rules that said that uh, African-American students couldn't stay with white students. They, were, they didn't allow interracial dating on campus. And that college, as a nonprofit and part of a religious organization, got tax exemption. And basically the IRS said, no way. We are not giving you a tax exemption for this. So, so we said religious or, or racial discrimination is not going to fly. But if you have some um, sincerely held belief that would give you exemption from employment discrimination laws, we generally let that go. We're, we're not going to overturn the murder laws. So. Well, and I would just say as a response to that also, it's been my experience that people come here from other countries. Part of the reason they come here is they greatly value our system of government and the Constitution. Even though they may have alternative religious beliefs, one of the things they really value, and particularly students I've had that either they themselves or their parents have become naturalized citizens, they know way more about the Constitution than I do. Yeah. Right. And they really they value really. that. I mean, it's something that's very, very important to them. Now, not all immigrants feel that way, but I think the majority, particularly those that really sign on want to be Americans, they really value the Constitution, and they'll tell you more about it than you can ever imagine. Uh, chance for to the gentleman back there in the room. Um, the thing about religion, um, anybody can say start a religion, but the Constitution does not define it. Do the courts define it? How do you define it? And what about taxes? Um, they get tax ex exemptions, but in a way, if they're not really truly religion, there's got to be a way to uh, determine whether that tax exemption. And others, and also like a Kim Davis. I'm not saying I'm not saying that she is not true in her belief that it's against her religion. But somebody else could come up with all kinds of things that not. Right. So somewhere along the way, the religion has to be defined, or how do we handle that? I want to see a tax. Uh, well, I mean, there are lots of there are lots of organizations that can fall under that. Um, the uh, as far as what counts as a religion. The court has run away from that uh, absolutely. Like they, they flat out refuse to say whether this is a valid or a sincerely held religious belief, or this is um, because they're getting so close. If I define what it means to be Catholic, if you let the government define what it means to be Catholic, um, then basically what you're saying is the government decides what Catholicism is, yeah. right? And then we have government defining what religions are and. Um, that is really close to establishment. That is really close to government establishing a religion. Now, they have not had to do it yet. I mean, there have been cases in lower courts um, with religious schools, uh, you know, say, firing their music teacher because uh, she was unmarried and pregnant, which violated the tenets of the religion that was associated with the school. Um, there were claims by the, the, the woman who was fired, well, the school isn't really that religious. And basically the courts are like, yeah, we're not really gonna ask how religious they are. They claim they're religious. Uh, we're, gonna reply, we're gonna say that they're religious and therefore they have that accommodation to make sure that the message that they're conveying is consistent with their religious beliefs. Because the freedom of religion, I get that, but the freedom of free speech doesn't allow us to, uh, like I think Wendell Holmes said, I can't somehow fire in here and think that's free speech. So there's got to be limits on what religion is. You can yell believe. fire in here if there's an actual fire. If there's actual, but not just to say it for the sake of saying, I want to say it, it's free speech. I mean, there is there are, and slander, libel. There are yeah, limits so, so, already in place that yeah. define free speech. And uh, say free, the Second Amendment, I was going to bring that up. The intention back then was not, I don't think, for us to have tanks in our home and A47s and whatever. You know, I don't know much about guns. But I think we've hijacked that Second Amendment and are not doing respect to the original intent of it. And uh, a well-regulated militia, well, I don't think we're regulating what's happening there. So, I, I, so I'm just curious about some of those ideas on our Bill of Rights and freedoms. As far as religion goes, the court has not said, in order to be a religion, you must meet these criteria. Um, they've stayed away from it. Now, that may come up uh, as we get more and more of these cases where you have um, individual, where you have requirements uh, for uh, whether it's 
through Obamacare or requirements for um, open accommodations um, as far as individuals whose uh, religious beliefs, conf private individuals whose religious beliefs conflict with those mandates from the government of anti-discrimination. Are they gonna dive deeper into whether you know, a particular doctor really has a, a deeply held a, a true religious conviction um, in his objection to do, to say perform abortions or uh, to provide birth control? Um, that is more likely to me that they're gonna ask that question. They're not gonna ask that question in Catholic Church. Does that make sense? It's an yeah, incomplete answer, but the, it's I guess an incomplete when people say it's against my religion, and then Kim Davis, Again, I, I think she is definitely violating the law, and she has an understanding, but she's running with this and just wasting a lot of time. But I agree with that. I think she should it. quit. I mean, if you if you take a job and you're not willing to do the requirements of the job, right. like my job is to teach economics, and if I went to Dr. Stovall and said, like, you know what, I think he said I'm just gonna sit in my office and twiddle my thumbs, he would fire me, rightfully so, um, regardless of why I felt like that's what I needed to do. Um, you take a job, you have responsibilities. If you don't fill those responsibilities, you shouldn't have that job. Right. I mean, I think that's basically what it comes down to. Well, on that note, <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, stop things today, mostly because I told some students we try to be finished by about 4.30, and we're already beyond that. I want to thank all of our speakers today for their thoughts. So if you've got an individual question or just something that's bugging you that we didn't cover here today, thank all of you for being with us today. Thanks for coming. Thank you.